do. Well, <clears throat> Alderney is a small island in the UK Channel Islands, which is located 60 miles from the English coast and 8 miles from France, and it has a long history of occupation. However, it was the occupation of the island by the Nazis during World War II which has had the most dramatic impact upon its landscape. In June 1940, the island's population was evacuated to mainland Britain after the British government decided the island was too expensive and difficult to defend. This uh, paved the way for a period of occupation by the German forces who de deemed it a strategically advantageous position from which they could invade mainland Britain. In order to facilitate large-scale construction of fortifications, thousands of people were sent there from across Europe to undertake forced labour under the control of Wehrmacht and SS soldiers. The story of these slave workers is not well known. Housed in Camp Silt, Helgoland, Nordney and Borkum, they were held in appalling living conditions, beatings and ill treatment were common, and many people were literally worked to death. The German garrison was housed in existing buildings such as houses or the pre-existing Napoleonic and Victorian forts. An archaeological project was launched in 2010 which aimed to locate, record and interpret the archaeology of the occupation and in 2014 and 15 the aim was to determine how the graffiti could increase our understanding of the experiences of the slave workers and their overseers. Systematic walkover survey was undertaken to record the complex range of engravings, marks, paintings, drawings and texts and impressions illicit and sanctioned that existed within the camps and fortifications. Graffiti were recorded in a uh, tailored field trip GB Pro former on a Samsung Galaxy tablet and accompanied by a tablet camera photograph. Additional photographs were taken with a digital SLR which were geotagged into a corresponding Pro forma in the resulting Google Earth database. <coughs> so to examine some of the findings. Slogans and operational instructions provide an insight into the working lives and attitudes of German soldiers stationed in Alderney. Here we have a well-known quote, quote by Prussian Army Field Marshal Gneisenau, which was located at the entranceway to a major strongpoint. Interestingly, despite building hundreds of military installations on Alderney, the Germans only were engaged in one minor military skirmish, and therefore the sentiment expressed here that it was life or death did not in fact the reality of the situation for most soldiers. Expressions of allegiance with the Nazi party and displays of ownership and occupation were found within many of the bunkers and the forts in which the German garrison were located. Two examples are shown here in the form of a Third Reich eagle, which has been painted over to preserve it by the current owner of the bunker, and a swastika above the fort entrance at Fort Elbert, one of the main living quarters and military strongholds. While some Nazi emblems were clearly authorised, others appear to have been created illicitly by individual or specific groups of soldiers. Swastikas, names and dates located around gun positions at Fort Albert may represent motifs made during periods of boredom, a state um, soldiers reported commonly in post-war testimonies. Interestingly, the local community have not attempted to erase these swastikas, in fact they've added a few of their own. A set of paintings located within another fort, Fort Torji, which was another garrison living quarters, demonstrate humour, something not often, of course, associated with members of the Nazi party. Um, and here we see a man with his hands below the water being blamed for the actions of an overzealous crab. Um, and a romantic <coughs> painting of a Bavarian castle perhaps represents a longing for Germany. One of the most significant findings of the graffiti survey were the names, often accompanied by wartime dates, which were found within the concrete fortifications built by the slave workers. Some are evidently German soldiers stationed on Alderney, um, as shown in this example by their military title. This one reads Gefreiter, meaning Lance Corporal E. Mitter Schirling. <clears throat> Turning our attention to the slave workers, traces of their existence on the island in terms of graffiti are somewhat more discreet, undoubtedly due to the fact that they were living under and working under the permanent scrutiny of Wehrmacht and SS guards. However, despite the risks involved, some prisoners <coughs> managed to etch their names into the usually wet concrete fortifications that they were tasked to build, and indeed we see the clustering effect here that, that Andy spoke of earlier. Many were written in the Cyrillic alphabet, and it is known that many workers sent, were sent to Alderney from Russia and other Eastern European territories. This evidence is particularly important because no transport lists or complete burial lists of those murdered here actually survive. The text shown here was particularly surprising since it reads, here worked Kostya Believ. Kostya is in fact a woman's name, and previously it was only thought that men were used as forced labour. 
In the prison cells at Fort Torgy, we also encountered large amounts of graffiti. Although, of course, it was difficult to determine who the prisoners were that were interred here, given the, fort that was given the fact that this fort was used as a jail in Victorian times. However, the presence of this etching, which lists the first letters of the German days of the week, along with an apparent date system, suggests that at least one German prisoner was housed here. Whether they were a forced labourer or a German soldier held by the British after liberation is not clear. Another seemingly unfinished etching is strikingly similar to the name of one of the camps on Alderney Log and Alderney. Handprints and footprints made in the wet concrete here may also have been made by slave workers forced to build them, either accidentally or in an attempt to leave evidence of their existence in light of the short life expectancy of those sent to Alderney. Mapping graffiti also allowed the construction dates of some of the fortifications to be established and demonstrated that the for what the forced labourers were working on at any given time. This is particularly important given that the Nazis destroyed much of the documentation around this point. One example is the dates etched on top of a large anti-tank wall along the southern coast of the island. Previously, aerial photographs had only provided, provided a vague idea of when each section was built. And so to conclude, I would like to reflect on some challenges and trends that I, I encountered when establishing um, the survey about historic graffiti. First of all, how can we establish dates and authenticity? Even following archival research on Alderney, for example, it was not clear often who and by um, and when graffiti were created. Indeed, one etching I discovered read Harry was here in 1945, and we were left wondering whether in fact Harry was indeed there. And if he was, was it he who etched this message, or was it a friend or relative? Did they do so during the occupation or afterwards as a form of memorialisation? Additionally, the graffiti provides evidence not available through other means, <coughs> particularly here, of course, I refer to the names of the slave workers. As I mentioned, there were no lists of transports of the people who sent to Alderney, and therefore this, these names represent the only legacy of many of the people who were killed there. Of course, it can also allow a discussion of previously um, ill-referred to items of, of um, his, um, Holocaust history in that we can consider issues such as resistance. These names, of course, etched um, a great risk to the prisoners who were sent there. We can consider religious beliefs and attempts of the prisoners and the German soldiers to reflect their own identity and individual and collective experiences. Of course, we can also examine post-war attitudes, and rather than seeing modern graffiti as a nuisance, we can actually read it as a sort of social history of attitudes towards the occupation on Alderney. As I mentioned, there are, there are frequent encounters with swastikas, with anti-Semitic graffiti, and bunkers are commonly used um, for the ever-popular bunker party, which has resulted in, um, obviously, the eradication of some of the previous occupation graffiti. And of course, here it raises important questions about how we preserve occupation graffiti, whether we should, and indeed, should we preserve this more modern graffiti, and what is its heritage value? My project is very much ongoing and research is now being conducted into the origins of these names and as a forensic archaeologist I'm particularly interested in using the, the names as a way of conducting missing persons investigations <coughs> coupled with searches for mass graves using more traditional archaeological methods. And based on the apparent potential of graffiti to reveal new insights into the nature of internment and forced labour on Alderney, an open access database centred on Google Earth is currently being developed. It is hoped that this will increase public knowledge concerning the plight of the slave workers, provide a form of presentation by record of this otherwise unprotected important body of material and encourage further debate. Thank you. <laughs>